I came to Arkansas in 2008, and the first thing that I did when I arrived with some funds that I got from the division is go out in the field and see what's happening. To my surprise, in the last uh, 15 or 20 years before I arrived, there wasn't too much done on, uh, on soybean virus, so I thought that would be a good uh, way for me to get involved in uh, soybean and start looking at uh, different diseases. Today I will talk about two diseases that my lab is in involved in. One is uh, vein necrosis and the other is uh, green bean syndrome. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I came in 2008 and I went out in the field. I, I drove all over the, uh, the state and I started looking for plants that had virus-like symptoms. And I have to say from the get-go, I was not and I'm still not an expert in soybean virus, but I'm trying. Believe me, I'm trying. What I saw out in the field are those type of symptoms here where you have some chlorosis around the main veins of the leaf. And I looked at the literature, I didn't find really anything that would cause those symptoms that we know about. And I tested for 14 viruses, none of which were found associated with symptoms like that. Actually, there were not really any pictures of uh, symptoms like that out there. Okay, if we can. So the question was, is there something new out there? At the same time that I was uh, working my way from Fayetteville to the southern part of the state, John Roop was in uh, Tennessee talking to Melvin Newman, who is uh, an extension or was an extension pathologist. He retired recently. And uh, Melvin told John of uh, this disease that seems to be hammering specific cultivars in the western part of the state, uh, particularly uh, near Milan, which is fairly close to the border with Arkansas. As you can see, you have some chlorosis that becomes necrotic, and actually in severe cases, you just have all the leaf die uh, around uh, uh, August. Interestingly enough, you know, John came back to me, they said, he told me, you know, the people in Tennessee have this problem and they actually tested for 16 viruses. They couldn't find anything. Would you like to take a look? Obviously, I jumped to the, the opportunity here and I, having my own results from the d symptoms I just showed you in the previous slide, I start looking for something new. And the first thing I did is, you know, doing some research, some molecular analysis of those plants. And I did get those A, T, Gs, and Cs. And they don't make much sense to me unless I plug it into a computer. And then you can develop a story. I got some uh, material that has symptoms and developed a detection test. Well, all of a sudden, I got to realize that we are talking about a totally new virus in our fields. This project went to the back burner because I didn't have too much time to work on it until this past March, where the promotion board uh, thought of this project as being interesting enough to fund it. So I got uh, a student in the lab to start working on that. And the first thing she did is using the detection test that was developed uh, the previous year is look at plants with those type of symptoms. She tested more than 200 plants. Every single one of them had the symptoms. And this is truly something unusual for soybean. Soybean viruses give symptoms that look, one virus symptom looks like the other uh, virus symptom this one is really unique. You see those symptoms, you know you have the new virus. How does that virus come around? We start looking at plants uh, in Fayetteville and uh, in Illinois that I have some collaborators, starting at the beginning of June. And the first symptoms came around mid-June. 10th to 20th of June, we start finding those first symptoms. 
as the system progressed, the symptoms became more prominent, and in certain cultivars, we had those, that necrosis showing up. When you work with something new, you really need to see what you are dealing with. So we start with the virus, and this is actually how this virus looks like. And then we learn its properties through what it has in its genome. We plug all that information to a computer, trying to figure out if we can learn from the previous knowledge something on this new virus. And what we figured out is that every single relative of this virus in the database is transmitted by thrips. So there's a 99.99% possibility that the new virus is also transmitted by thrips. Now, we've called this virus simply because it causes that vein necrosis, soybean vein necrosis virus. And here is the interesting story about it. I'll get to this phylogram in a bit and what information it gives to us. You can see two distinct groups here. Those are the relatives of this particular virus. Group A, as I call it here, is primarily vector with two thrip species. Group B is transmitted with two other thrip species. So the question is, which species out there in the field could transmit soybean vein necrosis? If it was here, I would say that we could make a guess of the potential vector in the field. But simply because it's so much out there, we can only guess. The other thing that uh, this phylogram tells us is that soybean vein necrosis virus is an ancient virus. And why is that important? Obviously, for me as a virologist, it is important. But it's also important for another reason. The older an organ is out there, the more diverse it is. And the more diverse, you can have different isolates evolving and you can get symptoms because of the changes you see in those unique isolates. So it can become very important. So by looking at this figure here, I would have expected that there is a lot of diversity of the virus out there. And the big question is, when you see symptoms out there in the field, what is the underlying reasons for having the, the symptoms? Is it the diverse virus isolate, or is it the plant germplasm? Looking at our fields, we realize that some plants give very severe symptoms, while some others very mild symptoms. Really, unless you are a virologist, you wouldn't really care too much about it. So we try to figure out what is causing the different symptomatology. As I mentioned, if you have something that looks sentient, you would expect a lot of diversity. So uh, between my collaborators and myself, we collected uh, samples from, th from seven states that you see here with the stars. And we really focused on things that have very severe symptoms and uh, plants that have mild symptoms. And we tried to figure out if we have different strains of the, of the virus causing the different symptoms. To my surprise, the virus is very homogeneous. There is not really much diversity. And this is really in contrast with what we expected. Our data from the virus told us that there should be lots of diversity. So what is happening? Everything seems to be the opposite way than they were supposed to be. There are really three things that we can, we can think about. The first one is that the virus was recently introduced in the United States, probably a single isolate, and then it spread to the soybean fields. The second would be that you had a vector that was feeding on host A or B and recently jumped to soybean. And the third one would be that the virus was and is still in uh, a wheat species out there, and uh, it recently jumped to soybean. So again, 
we have a bottleneck where you have few isolates moving into soybean. So a very important chapter of the whole study that we haven't even started addressing is which are the hosts out there that may be alternative hosts for soybean vein necrosis and act as a reservoir for the virus and overwintering host. When you get the soybeans in, it jumps from one host to the other. We will be starting looking at that next season. So what is next in this project? And as I mentioned, we are really uh, into that project for nine months now. And I think that uh, with, uh, with a great student I have in the lab, we have made great progress to it. But there is a lot more to learn about. The first thing is to know what thrip species transmit the virus. And most importantly, where do they overwinter? Alternative host, do we have weeds out there which can harbor the virus and allow it to overwinter? We need to know as much as we can about those hosts so we will be able to eliminate them from a system, hopefully, and thus eliminate movement of the virus. We're actually, uh, I was at a meeting in November with a North Central group, and they were really interested in, uh, in this thing. I have to point out here that the virus seems to make a lot of damage across or in areas that are close to the Mississippi River. If you go to Illinois or the boot hill of Missouri and you walk around the soybeans there, most of them, as you know, are evaluation fields from the companies. It's amazing how much disease we have. It's a good thing that in Arkansas, the cultivars that you grow are not as susceptible as those cultivars that we see up north, but it may be moving down. It is here, but it's not as prominent as it is in southeast Missouri and southern uh, Illinois. So hopefully with some funding from uh, North Central and hopefully USB, we'll be able to do some massive germ plus evaluation uh, about resistance with the virus. And then another thing that we would like to do is to look at different virus combinations, the viruses that we do find in the field, and see what is the effect of the combination of those viruses. It is now well understood that a single virus in soybean doesn't do too much of a damage. But when you have a second virus coming in, then health breaks loose. You can have significant yield losses when two viruses are there. And from a study that came out from the University of Tennessee, they saw significant uh, losses when they had soybean mosaic and alfalfa mosaic in the same plants. And we will try to do three virus in combination with soybean vein necrosis and see the effects in yield. Any questions here before I move to the next subject? Uh, when uh, I arrived in, uh, at the University of Arkansas, I had the pleasure to have Rick Cartwright to be the department head in, uh, at, at, uh, in plant pathology. And I do say that when I saw Rick coming in. I wouldn't say that if he wasn't here. Yes, yes. So uh, Rick calls uh, John Roop and myself in his office and say, well, you have to make a, a trip uh, to Prairie County. They have a problem down there. And this is a picture that uh, got with uh, John Roop, October 29, 2008. This is an 80-acre field. And although I didn't know too much about soybean at the time, I realized that it probably shouldn't be that green at the time. Some of the pictures we saw, extreme bud proliferation everywhere. Few pods will develop fairly normally, but the majority of them would just have one seed or would not develop properly. And for those of you that are dealing with soybean for years, you know about this, you've heard about it. It's called green bean syndrome or bud proliferation. As I mentioned before, you could have fields, 80 acres, every single plant have those type of symptoms. But there are other cases where you could have islands 
of plants having the symptoms. Those are areas that have been harvested and those are plants that have symptoms. And it's not very uncommon to get few plants here and there getting those type of symptoms. Now, as I mentioned, I'm not an expert on soybean, but it makes me wonder what's happening. And the obvious thing is that if you have those type of symptoms on any plant, what is happening is you have an agent that changes the physiology, messes up the plant hormones, and gives the plant the wrong signals. So having said that, we start looking. And as a virologist, I always want to start with something that I hope that will give me good results, and it's a virus. So tobacco ring spot virus has a history of, co of causing malformation in flowers and seed in many, many hosts. And when we did some inoculations in the greenhouse, those are the typical symptoms of the virus, we did get bud proliferation. So tobacco ring spot virus can cause green bean syndrome. The question is, can tobacco ring spot virus infect every single plant in an 80 acre field? The answer is absolutely not. Nematode transmitted virus transmitted fairly efficiently in the seed, but it simply cannot do uh, that much damage. But still, it's good to know that in areas where you have an island of plants so symptoms, you don't have to go too far, but you can look for tobacco ring spot and actually find the cause of the disease. Something else that was there in the literature is that bean pot model, another common virus, this is the most common virus in the state after soybean vein necrosis virus, can cause those type of symptoms. Messes up the hormones of the plant, gives the symptoms. Well, we did the experiments, but we could not replicate those type of bud proliferation. We, what we did find is that it can cause, not in all cases, but in, in quite a few plants, it can cause what people cause, call green stem syndrome. Another problem when it comes to harvest, but definitely not green bean. So, and next with bean pot model. When uh, I first arrived in that field that I showed you in, in the, the first picture of the green bean section, I talked to John Roop, I said, why did Rick send us here? Obviously because he wants us out of, of his office, but <laughs> the, the other, wh when you see those symptoms, you say, this is a phytoplasma. This is a waste of time. And uh, as it happens very often in my career, I'm always mistaken. So this is a report that came out from Louisiana in 1984. And it does look like proliferation. And they did some electron microscopy. They saw some bodies that looked like phytoplasmas. I suppose this is good evidence that phytoplasmas could cause the disease. Now, there are three labs in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Arkansas that were working on that. About, let's see, uh, five PhDs trying to figure out if a phytoplasma causing this disease, and we have been unable. So in our area, at this point of time, phytoplasmas do not cause green bean syndrome. But of course, because of the literature, we can see that it has the, they have the potential to do so. So yes and no. And the big one, when uh, we started, entomologists were, were telling me, well, stick back sometimes at some particular temperature and water regime, it could, it could cause that. And there were too many ifs in the whole process. So I decided to test that myself. And yes, stick bags in high populations can make this happen. Now, why would stick bags mess up the hormones of the plant? The first thing somebody can think about is that 
they really feed on the seed. When the seed is aborted, the signal back to the plant is the wrong signal. It breaks more buds, and you have the, the proliferation. That's number one. The second is that there is something that the stick bugs carry that cause those type of symptoms. So there is a guess, but I always have a question mark there. A, because I have not repeated those experiments, and B, because stick bugs by themselves should not have the ability to cause that type of disease in 80 acres of land. So we're looking for something else, and with the help from the promotion board, we are able to do the latest thing in technology. We're using something that has been out in the market for only two years, and we're trying to figure out if there's something else there, something unknown. And this is really hot out of the press. I got those results uh, late last week. There seem to be some bacteria that are in very high numbers in affected plants. Do those bacteria cause the symptoms? We don't know. We haven't even run the experiments. This is very preliminary. We just found that is something that is truly unusual for uh, soybeans, and we will be testing that the next year. And chemicals. This is the case where if you are using something to enhance growth or um, something that changes the physiology of the plant, if you spray the wrong time, it may actually do the proliferation. Uh, this is something that John Roop uh, got from uh, quite a few extension agents that they seem to associate green bean in small areas with uh, sprays of particular chemicals. Don't ask me about the chemicals. I don't know what exactly they are using. And finally, I need to acknowledge a lot of people that work in this project. John Roop that works... Uh, with me on the green bean syndrome, and then three virologists in three neighboring states. Uh, Jingzhu is a graduate student that is doing an amazing job in uh, the vein necrosis virus, and obviously I couldn't be able to do anything without the support of uh, the two boards and the Division of Agriculture. And now hopefully we'll have some questions. Okay. Uh, so the vein uh, virus there, do you have any indication of what, how much impact on the yield? We will be trying uh, to see what is the yield impact. You know, by looking the fields in the Boot Hill of Missouri and southern Illinois, in those areas, the loss is quite a lot. In Arkansas, I've seen it in every single field I have visited. But it's probably the cultivars that we grow that it may have some yield potential. I don't think and I hope that it's not going to be as hot as it is up north. But with the new cultivars that come out, we really need to, to look at it.